Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bjerko of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a first time guest, but I've been reading his research articles for years. Really interesting stuff over the years, seeking alpha in many other places. He's a co founder and chief investment officer at Cambria Investment Management. He has authored thousands of investing articles, numerous white papers, and five books. I don't know how he has the time for five books while also managing money and creating an exchange trade fund. Maybe he'll tell me how to manage my time better. He is also a frequent speaker on financial networks, including CNBC, Bloomberg TV, and Fox Business, and has been featured in Barron's, The New York Times, and The New Yorker. Also, I want to promote his new podcast, The Meb Faber Show. He has a lot of excellent guests on there about technology, investment, hedge fund managers, value investors, a lot of really interesting stuff. Meb Faber, thank you for joining me. Great to be here. So, Meb, we're recording this interview on Tuesday, September 5th, 2023. I want to ask you about the crazy global macroeconomic conditions affecting capital allocations for you as an asset manager. Is this the most difficult time of your career, considering all the other past financial crises and what central banks have been doing the last 15 or so years? You know, I think one of the most important jobs of any financial analyst, portfolio manager, is you have to become a student of history. And I don't just mean our own personal lifetimes, but certainly for the past 100, 200 years. And when you start to put things in context, it's macro is always crazy. There's always wars going on, countries ch changing borders. Uh, the What we like to say is normal market returns are extreme. Everyone is you know expects a 10% annual return in stocks, but very rarely is it around 10%. It's usually up 30, down five, flat, on and on. And so uh, the geopolitical events, one of my favorite charts, I'm an optimist at the end of the day, one of my favorite charts is always the S&P or the Dow or just the global stock market since 1900 and overlaid on that all of the crazy geopolitical events of the past 120 plus years. And there's always reasons to get uh, a little crazy with markets, but certainly during that time, uh, if you if you expand it globally, my favorite investing book is called Triumph of the Optimists by a few professors, uh, Dimson, Marsh, and Staunton. And they detail market returns and over, I believe it's up to 40 markets around the world now, back to 1900. And uh, going back to the beginning part of my answer into your question, you know, I think it's always important to put various events in context versus history. And be able to say, hey, look, has this happened before? Is this uh, you know, totally out of the realm of possibility of what has happened? And part of markets, the way things work is, by definition, things are always going to be crazier in the future than they have been in the past because uh, the maximum events you know, can only get more extreme. So never a dull day, that's for sure. Uh, as far as what's going on, I'm sure we can drill down and talk about all sorts of things. Uh, it, it definitely felt like a pretty unusual time the past few years with negative in yielding sovereign bonds with a lot of the meme stock mania. But if you put some of those in the context of history, it's not as crazy as what most people would think on uh, just on the surface. Yeah. So you mentioned Triumph of the Optimist. I've not read that book, but I'm familiar with the contrarian value investor approach. And that sounds similar to that. So the old Rothschild quote, and Warren Buffett has said similar stuff is be greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy. But the Rothschild quote is about blind, when, excuse me, is about buying when there's blood in the streets. I know you've written white papers about this in the past where you've gone into company uh, sectors or countries where literally there's blood in the streets. The sectors are down 70, 80, 90 percent. And you've shown with your research back testing this that if you were buying some of those quality companies that were down 70 or 90, 70, 80 or 90 percent the cycle turned. And then a few years later, you did very, very well. You know, there's a lot of examples. You look back in history, Apple, certainly one of the largest companies in the entire world with in the trillions of market cap now is basically in every decade in its existence, had a decline of 50% or more, I believe with the exception of the last decade. But uh, if you look at uh, Amazon, another company, you would almost have to be a psychopath to have held that the entire time because not only has it had multiple 50% declines, it had a 90 plus percent decline at one point. I think it was even 95%. So uh, the long history of markets though is that if you do diversify and you do allocate to many different countries and asset classes, 
performs fantastic over time. But any one country, any one security, you know, a lot of people, I believe, were surprised at Russia pausing trading uh, or, or excuse me, the U.S. pausing trading and, and Russian securities the past year or two. But the Russian stock market has shut down before, as has China's. And many other markets uh, have had essentially near 100% declines when the real returns after inflation in many markets were uh, minus 80, minus 90. I mean, the U.S. in the Great Depression was one of those markets. And so historically speaking, when markets are down a lot, it's usually fertile ground to be sifting through for opportunity. We did an old post back in the financial crisis talking about uh, Sir Templeton and the idea that back in the Great Depression of going and buying, I believe it was all the stocks trading below a dollar and then holding them for a few years. And he had fantastic returns. And we said something similar in uh, in 2009. But the long history of markets is that they are volatile and it's not uncommon for markets to go down 60, 80, 90%. There's an old investing joke that says, what do you call something down 90%? And that's something that was down 80% and got cut in half again. And so the the mathematics of being down 80% doesn't guarantee you that investment is going to go up. But often cases, sentiment and valuation and price are all related. And namely, when price goes down, the valuations go down, the sentiment is horrible, and it all aligns into an investment that's potentially very attractive. And on the flip side, what happens when markets go up? The price is, is increasing, investors get euphoric, and valuations get high. And that's just a story that's as old as time. My favorite example of sentiment is if you look at the American Association of Individual Investors, they do a survey asking investors, they say, are you bullish, you bearish, or neutral? And the most bullish, this goes back 50 plus years, 60, it might even be 70 years. Um, the most bullish they've ever been in the survey was December 1999, the peak of the internet bubble, the absolute worst time to be bullish on stocks in my lifetime. And flip side, when were they most bearish? March of 2009 at the exact bottom of the internet bubble, uh, excuse me, at the exact bottom of the global financial crisis. And so sentiment often works against those people by, uh, what's been going up a lot, they run away from things that have gone down. And so, I mean, a, a good example recently in a very small industry uh, would be cannabis. You know, many of those names have been left for dead. And, uh, you know, you have a slight bit of good news and all of a sudden they explode 50% higher. But this has happened many times over the years. On, on And right now we're seeing a huge opportunity in two particular markets, which we can get into, uh, where some of the valuations are the widest spreads we've ever seen. Uh, which usually leads to historic uh, positive and, and outsized returns in the coming years. That's interesting. And I know uranium was hated for many, many years too, but uranium the last uh, six months, eight months has really started to prop up. It was in a bear market for so long though, post Fukushima, it was in a bear market for over a decade. We had a post that we used to do for fun. And this goes back to my original book, The IV Portfolio, but we looked at asset classes, very broad ones, when they're down multiple years in a row. And then we extended that to sectors and industries. And we did a post on the blog many years ago, probably a decade, where we talked about industries that have been down, I think it was six years in a row. And at that time, it was the coal industry. And you can find the article, listeners, if you call it, the uh, why you should ask for coal stocks in your stocking uh, this Christmas. And we did an annual post on sort of what was the most hated asset class or industry or investment you know, where they were down 80% or down five years in a row or just universally hated. And certainly uh, the name you mentioned, a lot of the commodity and commodity producer, both equities as well as the actual commodities themselves have uh, been on that list many times over over the past decade, as well as many foreign and emerging markets uh, in, a, in a decade where U.S. stocks, particularly market cap weighted, have really trounced almost everything there's been a lot of opportunity outside of the traditional SPY index. Do you think that that's because of the dollar milkshake and that the Fed was expanding its balance sheet at a faster percentage than a lot of other central banks with asset price inflation and quantitative easing? If you look back to the bottom in 2009, both U.S. stocks 
were screaming cheap as were foreign and emerging. And if you looked at what's transpired in the ensuing 13 years, you find that U.S. stocks have performed much better. And usually it's a coin flip roughly for U.S. versus foreign. If you recall the decade prior to that, the U.S. had done very poorly and, and foreign and emerging had done much better. And what we've seen is that the multiple on U.S. stocks, we like to use the 10-year price earnings ratio, what some people call the Schiller Cape ratio. On average, over time, markets have around 18 PE. In low inflationary times, it's like 22 to 24. But in the U.S., it's been as low as five, and it's been as high as 45 in the internet bubble. And at the bottom of the global financial crisis, I believe it got to around 12. Again, that's super cheap. No one was buying then. But what's happened in the ensuing 13 years is that multiple has expanded a lot. Now, the U.S. has actually had better fundamentals, so that's part of it. But uh, a very large part of it has been multiple expansion. So the U.S. currently today sits around, I believe, a Schiller Cape ratio of around 32. At the peak of the meme stock mania, I believe it hit around 40, which is almost taking out the high of 99. It got pretty close. I thought for a minute the craziness was going to uh, going to take it out, but it's not. So we're, we're, we're pretty high right now for historic measures. But foreign developed, so MSCI is IFA or emerging markets, are quite a bit cheaper. Uh, foreign developed, I believe, is in the high teens. Mid to high teens and emerging is in the low teens. So they didn't have the multiple expansion. And multiple contraction expansion over time, it can be both additive or it can subtract from returns. And it can have a big influence, but all the multiple is, is really sentiment. And when that shifts, uh, you certainly can have times when that as a major detractor or headwind for equities. And if we look at the historical components of future expected returns, and John Bogle used to write about this, the head of founder of Vanguard, if you look at starting dividend yield, dividend growth, as well as multiple expansion, that puts you on a path for sort of low, mid, single-digit U.S. equity returns, whereas foreign and emerging would be quite a bit higher. Now, there's a pretty high possibility of a recession. I don't know if it's in six months, 12 months. I, I know Goldman Sachs is saying the possibility of recessions down at 10 or 15%. There's a lot of people saying there will be no recession. I'm seeing the consumer looks tapped out with credit card debt, with the interest rates, the lag effects. Are you looking to try to buy recession-proof businesses at low valuations now? So our oldest and the longest running ETF, we have a dozen now, uh, over 140,000 shareholders and about 2 billion in assets. But our oldest uh, is, is based on a concept called shareholder yield. And the ticker is SYLD. It just hit a 10-year track record this past spring. And the concept of shareholder yield is one that I believe stands the test of time. If you look at historical market simulations, you mentioned we do a lot of writing and a lot of research and of the various factors, we could not find a better one in the historical research than shareholder yield. And shareholder yield at its core is simply this, how much a company or stock is paying out to shareholders through cash dividends plus net stock buybacks. And embedded within that is the understanding that starting in the late 90s, companies started buying back more shares than they started then they paid out as cash dividends. And the reasons are because buybacks are more flexible. Buybacks also have a better tax treatment than dividends do. And an investor really should be agnostic as to how much and where that income comes from. And so as long as the aggregate and a holistic amount. And so for my dividend and income investing friends to ignore the impact of share buybacks means you're missing about half the picture, over half the picture of how a, ca a company distributes cash. And so you can simulate shareholder yield. We did a book. It's free online. If you go to my blog, Meb Faber or Cambria Investments, uh, on this topic of shareholder yield. And we looked at how those shareholder yield companies performed historically. And we found that indeed it they outperformed the broad market over time. And then if you look at how this fund has performed since inception, but what's most interesting, and, and by the way, the way our fund works is you have to include valuation ensemble too. So you want to be buying cheap stocks that distribute a lot of cash. This is like Ben Graham, Warren Buffett 101 level stock screening sort of concepts. It gives you companies that have lots of cash flow, 
that treat their shareholders with respect and distribute the cash flow. And they're trading at cheap valuations as well as being high quality businesses. So we, we avoid the ones that are over leveraged. Embedded with that portfolio is also the concept people love to get buybacks wrong. And really at their core, all they are are flexible dividends or tax efficient dividends. But at its core, if you look at that strategy in that portfolio, one of the things that a lot of people miss is the they're focused on the buybacks, but the impact of share issuance. And so there are so many companies today in the tech sector, I think is really the poster child for this, that just issue a ton of stock-based compensation for their employees, particularly the C-suite. They try to get away with not expensing it. They try to hide it. But really, that's a massive dilution to shareholders. And so if they're doing buybacks just to mop up their share issuance, then it has no net effect. So you really want to net out the difference between share issuance as well as buybacks. Anyway, the big difference, though, is in a world where the U.S. stock market only yields like 2%, so high yield is like 3 or 4%, Shareholder yield companies, you can easily get into the double digit yield if you incorporate buybacks as well. Now, what's interesting is despite the great performance of this fund since inception, uh, it's been in double digits and it uh, has been the number one performing fund in the entire mid cap value category. The cool thing is if you look at the valuation metrics all the way back to 2013, most of the valuation metrics like the PE ratio the valuation multiple spread versus the category as well as the S&P 500 has increased. So the discount to the overall market has actually widened over the past number of years. And so you have a scenario where, and this isn't for every value metric and it's not for every market, but on average value stocks versus the broad market are at some of the highest spreads we've ever seen. And other big quants and research shops talk a lot more about this. Cliff Asnes at AQR, Jeremy Grantham at GMO, Rob Arnott at Research Affiliates, on and on and on, talk about this wide value spread. And really in 2020 was one of the worst, is actually the worst year for value stocks ever. Worse than 1999, cheap versus expensive. Now, I think the regime shifted uh, and with the peak of the internet, excuse me, the meme stock mania. And value stocks have done great since then. But despite that, they're one of the biggest valuation spreads ever. So we're pretty excited about the value opportunity. We're talking single-digit PE ratios, double-digit shareholder yields, a lot of great characteristics for these businesses versus the overall market. It's certainly got a vibe feel similar to the late 90s with the very heavy market cap weighted. We did a post on my Twitter today talking about uh, some of the comparisons back to the late 90s and many of the tech companies that were ascendant at that time that did very poorly thereafter. Businesses just did just fine, which is a key takeaway is you always have to separate the stock from the business. The business could be great, but, the, but if a stock gets way too overvalued, the performance of that actual investment could do very poorly for a very long time. Do you think that disparity you mentioned with the general stock market indexes, is that because of the index fund bubble that Michael Green has been documenting for years, where a lot of people's retirement accounts, their 401ks, their IRAs have such limited options. So, so many people are index funding. And in all of that retirement capital it, for Americans and other foreign investors is going into what these market cap weighted index funds. And so those value stocks, those quality companies are not getting the capital allocated. It's going into these index funds. So like the, the FANG stocks and some of the others are just getting larger and larger. So there's a couple points embedded in your concept. And market cap weighting was an amazing invention 50 years ago when John Bogle and others started putting out these index funds. But it wasn't actually the market cap weighting that was the major innovation. It was what market cap weighting enabled, which was low cost investing. So it's been the best time ever to be an investor right now. You can go buy a portfolio of ETFs for almost 0%. If you include the short lending, it's actually probably 0% or actually fee expense ratio negative, meaning you're getting paid to own the portfolio, which is insane and awesome at the same time. But that really no longer has anything to do with market cap weighting. The reason it was he was able to deliver these portfolios for low costs is market cap weighting. You don't do anything. You buy a portfolio of investments, you let them sit and they float. Now, the Achilles heel of market cap indexing 
is that there's no tether to fundamentals like you mentioned. And so uh, theoretically, a stock could continue going up and up and up and up, and it could have no revenues. And it could have an infinite PE ratio. And so it's a uh, it's not normally a problem the vast majority of the time with market cap weighted index, except when they get very expensive. And because of that, you have a number of examples in history. Obviously, the US is the world stock market at 60% of the total today. And it's one of the most stock expensive stock markets in the world. Now, it's not crazy. And I don't think it's a bubble, but I do think it's expensive. But the problem is, if you're a global investor, you're putting 60% in the US and the Sad reality is the vast majority of Americans put 80, 90, 95, 100% in US stocks. And so you're putting most of your money in this market cap weighted index when it's expensive. Now, this has happened Japan in the 1980s was the largest stock market in the world. It was actually the stock market valuation hit double the, the expense ratio, uh, the expense valuation, excuse me. The Japan stock market hit the 10-year PE ratio of almost 100, which is double what the U.S. was in, in 1999. And if you were a global investor, you put most of your money in Japanese stocks in the 80s, and they went nowhere for decades. And they're still a top three global economy. So the uh, the challenge of market cap weighting is it doesn't have that tether to fundamentals. But the nice thing about moving away from market cap weighting is you should be able to realize higher returns by doing things like value investing, Warren Buffett, we tweeted the other day, we said he's owns my number one favorite investing statistic that sounds completely false, which is if you compared his performance of Berkshire versus the S&P back to inception, Berkshire stock could decline 99% from the levels it's at today and still be outperforming the S&P since inception. And that is such an astonishing statistic. And listeners, if you don't believe me, you can go. <laughs> you can go run the math. I had to do it because I didn't believe the author. Uh, the author of the quote. This was uh, Chris Bloomstrand, who was on my podcast, and he said he eventually told it to Warren Buffett, and Warren said Ben Graham would be proud, but let's not te- let's not test the math. And so, um, but this concept being is that if you the indexes are great for what they are, which is you're guaranteed to capture the winners. And the losers, as they go down, will become smaller and smaller parts of the portfolio. So indexing market cap weighted, is it's fine. It's a good start. It is the aggregate. It is the average. But we think you can outperform it fairly simply uh, with some tilts or approaches. Obviously, we love value. And the way we express that is shareholder yield, uh, which works not just in the U.S. throughout time, but also in foreign and emerging markets as well. So you think then that um, active management or cycling and selling winners after they run up and then looking for bargains, discounted value over the long term that will benefit, that will outperform the market cap index? Because it seems that index fund the last 10 or 15 years has way outperformed value, but that could eventually change. If you look at, we did another tweet where we said, look, there's been, if you look at the 10-year rolling S&P returns since 1900, Maybe it was 1920, I can't remember, but I think it was 1900. And there was like four mountaintop peaks. The Roaring Twenties, 1920s, not the current Roaring Twenties. The Nifty Fifties, which was the middle of the 20th century. The internet bubble, and then whatever you call the COVID bubble of peaking in the last few years. So there's been four times in history where you've had these markets where they've been doing about 15% per year. Said differently, if you risk adjust them and do sharp ratio, there's been four times in history where these markets uh, have had a sharp ratio, rolling tenor sharp ratio above one. And for the historians out there, you know that on average asset classes tend to cluster around 0. 0.2, 0. 0.3 over time. And so a sharp ratio above one is, is extremely rare. If you're a hedge fund manager with sharp ratio above one, you're probably managing in the billions. Now, what happened after those four periods was that these these monster returns were followed by subpar, meager, or pretty bad returns. The 20s was followed by the Great Depression. The nifty 50s, 60s was followed by the inflationary 70s. The internet bubble close followed by uh, the internet crash as well as the global financial crisis. And so here we are really on the fourth one. And it doesn't mean the market has to crash and it doesn't mean that um, returns can't be acceptable. But what it does mean is that on average, the headwinds are there. And however, this year, 
<laughs> it's, uh, you know, you can see that the markets can uh, can continue to go up. There's no specific uh, catalyst that everyone always hopes for. They're obviously in retrospect, but but on average, that bet of U.S. market cap weighted. Now, the good news and the optimist is, if you look at say 45 investable countries around the world, the vast majority of them are totally reasonably valued, as well as all the way down to cheap to all the way down to screaming cheap. And so if you look at shareholder yield around the world and foreign developed, so the, the we mentioned earlier, the indexes, IFA and EEM are much cheaper than the US, but the shareholder yield in those two regions, geographies are likewise extremely attractive. So if you look at uh, all three regions have a single digit PE ratio, the one difference in foreign markets more than the US is they tend to be a little more dividend focused culturally than buybacks. Now that's changing a little bit, but the the percentage breakdown of the buybacks versus dividends is probably closer to 50-50 in foreign markets versus in the US where it's probably 30-70 maybe is dividends to buybacks. And so you'll see them have much higher dividend yields so far FYLD and EYLD funds for example i believe they're in sort of the five six plus percent dividend yield range so they have a much higher dividend yield but that's because as a percentage of the total that they do less buybacks although you see the culture shift in japan as well as other countries uncle warren buffett was just over in japan buying up some more mm -hmm. japanese stocks so uh we think those two opportunity sets value stocks within the us as well as moving abroad and particularly digging for value there are huge opportunities. The sad reality, though, is the vast majority of Americans, if that's the majority of the audience, uh, allocate almost nothing to global stocks. And that's called a home country bias. It's true, sadly, not just in the US, but everywhere in the world. My Aussie friends put all their money in Aussie stocks. My Japanese friends do the same on and on. And it's a really foolish idea uh, throughout history. Aren't American companies triple tax? So if you're an American investor and you want dividend stocks, you you want your income from dividend stocks, aren't they triple tax by the time the retail investor gets the dividend? And then they're paying a, a tax on the dividend too. So the corporate profits, I think the average person doesn't understand how much dividends are actually taxed by the time the retail investor gets the dividend check. Yeah, you know, dividends, we did an article a long time ago on this. We said dividends have a great brand. There's nothing that people love more than passive income, this fantasy of being on the beach sipping a pina colada and just having the dividend checks roll in and buybacks for some reason have a, a much worse brand i think uh, we did a piece called faq on share buybacks for politicians gurus investors journalists everyone basically saying here's some resources about 20 articles on buybacks because we consistently hear them uh, get maligned in the popular press and unfortunately uh, we don't teach personal finance and investing in school. And so a lot of people get the, the topic wrong, which is unfortunate. But you're right. Dividends uh, do get taxed. We wrote, we've written a handful of academic papers and we wrote one, I believe it was during the pandemic, it might have been before that I don't know if anyone read that said for taxable investors, the last thing you want is actually high dividend yields if you're in the super high tax bracket because uh, you get taxed on them, as you mentioned, and and in fact, you would actually be better off with a value approach that avoids the high yielding stocks. I don't think anyone read that paper, but um, the concept is interesting. In the U.S., the actual the vast majority of assets are tax exempt, so people investing through their four hundred one ks or IRAs or pension funds, et cetera. So it's it's less of a factor, but still something to consider. It's always only thing that matters, of course, is returns net after all costs, and that includes both taxes as well as uh, expense ratios too, which is a huge one that most people tend to overlook. And the most brilliant thing Wall Street has ever done was make fees and expense ratios as a percentage that just get skimmed, skimmed off over time so no one ever sees it. Uh, but it, But in fact, obviously, costs add up as uh, Jack Bogle was very clear to uh uh to elucidate 
I'm in the David Einhorn camp about share buybacks. So he makes a distinction between share buybacks with free cash flow and the management team is actively looking at the stock market valuation, the valuation of the company relative if the valuation is down a lot and the management thinks the underlying business is doing well or share buybacks with debt. So what has been happening in the zero interest rate policy environment where cap uh, debt was artificially cheap, a lot of these companies, the large caps did financial engineering with their high credit rating. And so they did share buybacks with debt. They weren't doing it with free cash flow. So I would make the distinction. And if management is actively looking at valuation there and saying, hey, our stock is cheap, we're doing insider buying, we're buying more of our own shares, and we're doing share buybacks with free cash flow. Which is why you never trust management for what they say of course and so the way we do it is rules-based quants as we say look we want these stocks to be objectively cheap and it doesn't really matter the exact valuation metrics you use you could use enterprise value to EBITDA you could do price cash flow you could do price earnings I don't know that it matters that much you would just want them to be broadly speaking on the right side of the universe versus the really expensive ones because as you mentioned there are plenty of CEOs that always think their stock is cheap. And so you need a methodology. We lo we love uh, Buffett's. It's simple. He says, look, we're going to buy back Berkshire when it's below 1.3 times book. And that's pretty simple and not that complicated. And what did he do during the pandemic? He bought back a bunch of stock. And so um, I, I think the last thing you want is an expensive company buying back their shares because that's hugely value destroying unless you're the seller it's great if you're the seller <laughs> but if you're if you're owning uh, a security but on average owning expensive stocks in general is a terrible idea and over time has been a, a pretty poor return stream so we agree with you we think it's absolutely critical to make sure these companies are um trading at, at lower valuations versus just the CEOs thinking their stocks always cheap well, on top of that, Meb management was also using debt to to do that. So they were using debt, loading the balance sheet with debt. And now we're in a higher interest rate environment. And now they have to roll over that debt at much higher rates. So if they have a revolving credit facility, they're paying a much higher interest payment on debt. If they're going to the corporate bond market, they're paying a much higher interest rate on debt there to, to roll over their bonds. And it, it's the higher interest rates that the Fed is, has done is go, the lag effects now the last 12 something months is going to start really affecting the economy and these corporations that were doing that financial engineering trick, loading the balance sheet with debt for share buybacks. Leverage works both ways. It can certainly amplify the good times, uh, but it can be a killer in the bad times. It uh, it's it's something that the vast majority of individuals don't need and get into huge trouble with. But certainly companies too. Uh, it can be uh, it can be a many companies in the graveyard have been because of over leverage. So I want to ask you about sovereign debt crisis. We have the U.S. Treasury now. It looks like they're projecting around $2 trillion now in budget deficits, but there's government debt problems all over the globe. How do stocks normally respond when governments have sovereign debt crisis like this in past financial history? Oh, boy. Well, um, I think it's pretty individualized for the various countries. It's always a challenge to, I mean, look, the politicians for as long as markets and governments have been around, spend as much money as they can get their hands on. And uh, it's always been a, a struggle to have some discipline there. The good news is many countries have quite a bit of assets as well. And uh, the balance sheet often ends up looking okay. But certainly, it's hard to get our heads around the aggregate levels that we're talking about here. When you start to get past three commas, I think everyone has a human <laughs> struggle with thinking in absolute terms like that. So, look, I think um, I think in general, it's uh, it's something to be wary of. There's no magic line in the sand that I think, uh, looking back at the various academic articles, to say where, hey, you're okay up to this level, and then after this is dark times, um, because there's a lot of ways that not just countries, but companies and markets can sort of wade through it. There's plenty of other ways that are much more immediate and stark and painful. And there's other ways where you just kind of muddle through. Ray Dalio has put out quite a bit of great research on some of this global macro geopolitic and certainly the debt topic. Um, 
but it's it's hard to say exactly what the the levels are that create a higher risk of frailty but certainly adding on more and more debt pushes you towards that side of the spectrum so do you think then central banks like the european central bank bank of japan federal reserve bank will have to go back then to some type of yield control yield curve control or financial repression then to get lower interest rates because uh, if people just start working out the math the national debt is growing so rapidly the budget deficits are blowing out i see tax receipts for the federal government starting to come down if asset prices crash for stocks and bonds that'll make things even worse for government finances the math just doesn't work at some point at higher rates for the government do you see then that they're going to probably have to go back to some type of uh financial repression or yield curve control i don't know you know the um markets have a way of clearing over time and whether in the united states and other places it means there's going to be higher inflation for longer and as you mentioned the financial repression periods i mean there's been plenty of periods in the past where you've had inflation above the bond yields uh for an extended period of time whether that continues i mean bond bonds right now are some of the at or near some pretty historic drawdown levels on nominal basis real we're not quite there yet one of my favorite quizzes if you follow me on twitter listeners i've been doing polls for a long time and i love to poll people just to test their knowledge and we have a pretty advanced follower base i don't think you could follow me and, and really stick around we're on kind of the boring market level drivel that we talk about all the time but we said you know what what do you think the maximum real drawdown on 10-year bonds was historically in the us and most people think it's like zero to five five to ten and the answer is over half and so we're at some of those nominal drawdown levels already but on a real basis we're not we're not quite at the highest they've ever been which is usually somewhere around the 1970s um but bonds historically have been an incredibly risky asset class for the reason you mentioned which is these long st stocks usually crash right it's the price based declines but for bonds it's the long drawdowns that uh inflation just erodes uh the real return of those uh investments yeah we had a 40 year bond bull market in US treasuries as interest rates were coming down post Paul Volcker do you think then that the bond bull market is probably over it's probably dead but there might be some rallies though you know if you look at the long history of asset classes it's hard to be asset class agnostic, meaning you're not all in and cheering for one asset. A lot of people are, you know, you talk to investors, they're gold bugs, they're crypto people, they're, they buy their 10 US dividend yielders, whatever. There's a million different approaches out there where people are all in on one asset class. And I would say the people who put all their money in US stocks, it's the same camp. And we think it's a big mistake. You know, we did a book on asset allocation called global asset allocation it's free to download online as well and that book looked at a lot of the various asset allocation portfolios and and really found the analogy we always made it was about like baking where my mom was a southern cook and if you make chocolate chip cookies as long as you have the main ingredients you have some flour and water and, and butter and chocolate chips like they're probably going to come out good and you don't have to have exact amounts but if you exclude an entire category, you don't use flour or don't use butter or chocolate chips, like they're probably going to taste terrible. And so that's kind of how we try to fame, frame investing globally, where you want some global equities, you want some global fixed income, which is actually the largest asset class in the world, particularly XUS, and you want some real assets, meaning things like real estate or REITs, commodity, commodity equities, tips. Now, the two categories that the vast majority of people are missing in a U.S. traditional allocation are they don't allocate to foreign stocks at all. And if they do, it's way less than the market average. And two, they have very little real assets. And precious metals are also in that category. Now, they do have a house usually, which tends to be the largest percentage of an individual's net worth for um, sort of middle class and below for high net worth investors, the 10, 100 million plus, it's businesses and stocks. So they get this concept. But having a diversified portfolio across all those asset classes ends up being a much better job than doing just one alone, on average, usually across most of time. And so fixed income, look, 
We think having a uh, fixed income exposure is totally reasonable today. A lot of investors we spoke to last spring, the summer, they felt like the majority answer what they're up to. They're just like T-bill, T-bill and chill. You know, they've got this magical 5% yield that they haven't had in many moons. And so they've started really putting money into these cash-based uh, sort of yield investments that they haven't had for a long time. But as you mentioned, if inflation starts ticking back up into year end, which we expect, that that starts to get a little nervous for people and seeing uh, inflation north of 4% again is uncomfortable, particularly for equity markets, because equity markets historically, when inflation is north of 4%, the multiple on stocks that p- investors are willing to pay is not 22 or 18, it's about 12. And so uh, that becomes problematic because investors hate paying a high multiple on stocks when inflation is high. We don't expect it to go crazy again, like the 70s, but certainly expect it to start ticking back up into uh, into year end. And then from there, <laughs> who knows? But I think there's been an underinvestment in commodities, a lot of different natural resources for many decades now. Yeah. You know, I think... Um, I think depending on the cohort, the only people that really invest in real assets across the board tend to be my Canadian and Australian friends. You know, the, they 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 uh they tend to have a lot more in these types of investments, but historically speaking, it's been an essential part of a portfolio. Gold is one of those investments that I think people love it or hate it. There's not a lot of in between, but again, looking back at assets being somewhat agnostic try to get away from those emotions and think of just how does this fit in a portfolio gold historically has been one of the best things you could add to a traditional u.s based portfolio as a diversifier oh i agree about diversification i think online there's a lot of people now that are youtube channels that have like all in on u.s treasuries or all in on bitcoin i I just warn people if i hear anyone say all in on any one asset class or any one stock is just very, very dangerous. There's tons of red flags going off for me that the person is like, they're gambling. They're not actually investing. Yeah. And that's been true forever. You know, I think investing, we think it should be pretty boring. We think you should spend about zero time on investing. We were having a debate on Twitter the other day where a friend had remarked that uh, investing has been solved is what he meant. And and his concept being you could allocate to a, a globally diversified portfolio in one click for almost nothing is is incredible. And we actually have a couple global allocation funds. And uh, we had a post said the best way to add yield to your portfolio is, is to do that, to spend zero time on it. And look, if you do it for a hobby or interest, that's one thing. God bless you. We, we love it. But if you're actually spending a ton of time on your portfolio, we think that's probably... Uh, a suboptimal way to try to increase the returns. You should really just put it on autopilot, spend the time ahead of time setting up a beautiful, great allocation, and then uh, and then just move on with your life. Are you referring to day trading? So a lot of day trading, because a lot of day traders don't generate great returns. I know a lot of people are trying to do that to make an income from that with day trading or short-term swing trading, but most people just are not successful with that. But I, I think if people do spend time looking at some of the white papers you've written in the past, looking for contrarian value opportunities over the long term, so marijuana stocks or uranium from a couple of years ago, there was a lot of value in those types of plays. It's just it took a couple of years for the cycle to turn, but the returns now for some of these uranium stocks, oil was cheap six months ago. Look at the record amount of hedge funds that were short oil futures contracts. I mean, I was getting called tons of names six months ago for saying anything nice about oil or interviewing oil guests. The nice thing about having a systematic approach, obviously I'm biased. I I really struggle and feel for my friends that are in the discretionary world where they wake up each morning trying to decide what to do. Everything we baked in is rules-based. And so we have portfolio processes that will move tilt towards the cheap stocks and they'll rebalance. So rebalancing is one way, of course, to accomplish this. So if you have a traditional portfolio and you consistently rebalance, you're consistently selling what's going up and, and buying what's going down. So that captures a little bit of that effect, but we have, we didn't really talk about it today, but uh, some of my oldest research and a very integral component of what we do in our portfolios is trend following style investing strategies. Again, these are rules-based, but trend following is an active strategy that is one of the best, if not best, 
diversifiers to a traditional portfolio, it's also not easy to follow. I mean, asset allocation, buy and hold is hard because of the big drawdowns when everything's hitting the fan, like the global financial crisis or COVID. Trend following tends to do great during those periods, but it's other periods where it tends to look rather foolish or may underperform, and it's hard for people to fall in those times. And so uh, we do both and think there's a lot of merit to both those strategies. Uh, trend following did exceptionally well um, last year, which is one of the worst years ever for 6040, largely because it was short bonds. And uh, there's not many strategies that were short bonds last year. And so that was a savior for many. It's not keeping up with uh, the crazy markets this year, but not much, not much will keep up with the cues when they're off to the sort of romping, stomping return they are this year. So you did mention some commodities. I think you've had some commodity guests on your podcast. I think Jeff Curry, who used to work at Goldman Sachs, the head of their Goldman Sachs trading division, you had him on the not, uh, not long ago. Do you think then that there's supply side problems? So you mentioned that investors should be diversified and have some exposure to commodities, but do you think that there's legitimate supply side problems? Because we're seeing in the news headlines that there's rice shortages, food shortages in a lot of different countries. Um, there's energy shortages. Clearly, Europe had a natural gas problem with electricity. German manufacturers were leaving the country because electricity was too high. Fertilizer plants shutting down. Do you think that it's going to take a lot of investment to solve on the supply side these problems going forward? We talk a lot about, you mentioned a podcast on natural resource topics. I come from a farming background on my father's side. We still talk about farmland investing a lot. It's kind of hard to do in the public markets, but certainly as an operator or in private markets, it's uh, a, a wonderful asset class. But the long history of commodity markets is they're super volatile. And you know the you have just looking at the price of oil or cattle or sugar, what whatever it may be is... Uh, that's sort of the story of commodity markets is they tend to be uh, a little bit crazy. And so supply and demand acts out on the stage in real time with those markets. And it uh, they often don't correlate to each other, which is one of the benefits of having diversified commodity exposure as you pick up a little rebalancing on that sort of concept where uh, you know the, the ones that are trading down a lot, you're consistently rebalancing into. But uh, but we certainly think it's a unique asset return stream to a traditional portfolio. And particularly the, the biggest benefit is it has exposure to inflation, but also unexpected inflation and rising inflation. Commodities are, are almost a unique asset class that traditionally does great there. Gold does great sometimes. Most other asset classes, it's uh, either terrible or a mixed bag, depending on what in times of inflation. So commodities, we think... Uh, a lot of different ways to do it and a lot of different ways to get that sort of resource exposure as well as real asset exposure tips being another idea there. Um, but having diversified basket and REITs too uh, can be a, can be a wonderful complement. Also with commodities, you benefit from emerging market growth too. So if you don't want to buy individual emerging market stocks, if an emerging market, the economy is improving there, people are going to consume more energy. They're going to go buy cars or scooters. They're going to consume more gasoline and diesel. They're going to eat more calories. So these are things that will benefit commodities then. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the the ascent of the human race, it's, uh, you know, getting into the hopefully multi-planetary at some point. And, uh, you know, tens of billions of people is going to be a story of resource constraint, but we're optimistic and technology certain helps. And it's, uh, it's a lot of fun to see the innovation that's going on, not just on the farms. We do a lot of startup investing. I do personally have invested in over 300 private angel investments and uh, the farmland ecosystem is uh, certainly no stranger to one that's uh, getting a very quick, heavy tech adoption. But that's been true for decades now on the on the tech side with farming too. And you have a new episode out that just came out a few days ago on artificial intelligence. Are there going to actually be products and services soon besides chat GPT? Oh, sure. I think there's going to be a lot. I mean, I think I did my first private AI investment almost a decade ago, and people have been talking about AI for many, many decades now, but you're certainly starting to see some very real-time advances that are going to be pretty life-changing certainly in our lifetimes but i think even quicker in, in probably this decade you're going to start to see some pretty uh fun exciting developments rather than just trying to come up with jokes and stories on chat gpt i think it's going to accelerate and it's going to be certainly uh 
uh, game changing technology for this decade and and on. But you think a lot of these artificial intelligence stocks are probably ahead of themselves on valuation, though? Oh, stocks, that's different than the business and technology. That's true always, right? Um, if you look at the companies, just the sheer math of what works out on stocks, you know, you only have about 5, 10% of stocks that generate all the performance over time. The Walmarts, the Amazons, the McDonald's, and the vast majority of stocks don't do much better than T-bills or worse. And so looking at the long history, the disruptors eventually get disrupted. And that's, again, like if you look at the top 10 market cap stocks by decade, it's fun to look at over time because you don't see all the same names today that you saw 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, certainly not 50, 60, 70 years ago. And so the the technologies certainly will uh, play out on both the company level as well as stock level. And then you have to distinguish between the valuations too. And, you know, we talk a lot about valuation. It's not just PE ratios, but also relative to the growth rates too. It's two sides of the same coin. So you can have high growers. I mean, if you look at Apple being Berkshire's largest position, certainly today, and we held that for uh, from 2013 to 2020. And um, you can have these massive growth rates and, and have still be low valuations, but certainly flip side is true. Traditionally buying a basket of stocks, trading at price to sales ratio above 10, and certainly 20, 30, 40, it's an absolutely horrific investing idea over time and has done very poorly. Mab, I want to thank you so much for your time today. Hopefully you're willing to come back on for another interview in the near future. It's been a blast. Thanks for having me. And I'll put a link to your Mab Faber show research link and also to your podcast and your YouTube channel. Great. Thanks so much.